It's my pleasure to invite up onto the stage this evening um, my colleague, Frank Beckwith, who is a um, professor here at Baylor of Philosophy and Church State Studies. And he will be introducing our plenary speaker this evening. So, Frank. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's my honor to introduce our speaker this evening, Christian B. Miller. He is the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University, an expert on the study of character and ethics. He examines whether character traits such as courage, compassion, and honesty really exist and play a role in human behavior. He also explores how to develop a virtuous character and overcome character flaws, as well as what it means to be a person of good character in the first place. Miller directed a five-year, $5.6 million project on the existence and nature of character called The Character Project, with funding from the John Templeton Foundation and the Templeton World Charity Foundation. He has published over 70 academic papers and is the editor of The Continuum Companion to Ethics, Character, New Directions in Philosophy, Psychology, and Theology, Moral Psychology, Volume 5, Virtue and Happiness, and essays in the philosophy of religion. He is also the book review editor of the Journal of Moral Philosophy. He's the author as well of, of three books, including Character and Moral Psychology published in 2014, which presents a new framework for thinking about character and virtue, and The Character Gap, How Good Are We?, which was published in 2017. He is also currently working uh, in the, as the philosophy director of the Beacon Project, which received a $4 million grant from Templeton Religious Trust to study the morally exceptional. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Christian Miller. So much to right. Is this on? Can you hear me? In the back? Yes? All right, good, good, good. Uh, so nice to be here. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Thank you so much to Baylor and the Baylor Institute for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful conversation, this wonderful conference. Uh, I'm in a bit of a difficult spot in the program, I think. Uh, first of all, I, I'm coming after an exceptional talk last night that there's no way I can try to live up or follow that talk. I'm also at the end of a very long day of very rich papers, plus, an excellent dinner, and a very good dessert. So I've got a challenge in front of me. Uh, so what I'm going to do is maybe be a little bit more relaxed than you normally see a talk uh, in philosophy. I'm going to ask for some help from the audience at various points. Where are the students? Students in the back? OK, I'm going to call on you, so be warned. A couple of times, so I'm going to ask for your help. And uh, my goal will be, if nothing else, to keep you awake for the next 45 minutes. So um, with that in mind, I think I want to get started by saying good evening, everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Um, so uh, I, I, uh, I want to think about the topic of character from three different perspectives tonight. One is a philosophical perspective. That'll be the first part of the talk. The second is a psychological perspective. That's the second part of the talk. And the third part, the longest, will be a practical, educational, applied perspective. And I have a lot to say, I hope, about actually cultivating good character in students. What I hope to say will be really uh, something that's uh, relevant, applicable, no matter what discipline you're coming from or what field you you're do your research in or where your appointment might be, that you can take something away from this talk and, and apply it uh, back at your home institution or wherever you're coming from. So with that in mind, let's get started. Uh, I'm ready to go. Character project. So as was already mentioned in the introduction, for five years, I directed this thing called the Character Project. I'd encourage you to go check out what we've done. We've got videos, we've got resources, we've got publications, a lot of stuff up there on that website. So come check out what we've been doing at Wake Forest. I've already told you the plan for the evening. First, what is good character? That's going to be the philosophy part. I think it's as a philosopher, I can't help it. I got to define my terms. I got to be clear about what we're talking about. So we'll start with that. Then I'll shift to an empirical question. As a philosopher, I can't answer that question. How good is our character? From the armchair, I need some empirical data to draw on uh, to help me with that, so I'll look at some psychology studies. With that, I really want to reserve a lot of time for this last section, cultivating good character in students. Sounds good? Ready to go? 
All right, thumbs up. Good, good, I like that. Here we go. What is good character? So here are some assumptions. I can't argue for everything. I'm just going to state these assumptions. I think in this crowd, I'm going to be pretty safe, I hope. A person with a good moral character is someone who has moral virtues. Wow, that's not very controversial. Right? We're good? Examples. Students in the back, shout them out. Give me an example of a moral virtue. Courage, give me another one. Honestly, give me another one. Very good. Easy. A person with bad moral character is someone who has moral vices. Give me some of those. Lust, give me another one. Pride, give me another one. Read, okay, very good, good. We got it. We got it. We're, we're good to go. Um, hey, uh, it's after dinner. It's been a long day. We're, we're, we're trying to make this work. Um, of course, that doesn't take us very far. So I'm going to understand character in terms of virtues and vices, but that just invites the question of what is a virtue and what is a vice. So I could give you the abstract philosophical account, at least the one I like. Uh, that wouldn't be so fun, I don't think. So let's do something a little different. I'm going to start with an example of compassion and build up to an account of a virtue using an example. So here's a question for you. These are really hard questions I, I can see. Uh, if someone picks up some drop papers only once, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? Uh, really, really hard ones tonight. Um, they, they, trust me, they'll get harder as we go along. So students, what do you think about that? No, clearly not, right? Why not? Whoops, I gave the answer away. Um, what's missing here? If someone picks up some drop papers only once, you can shout out, students. What? Persistent, very good, yeah, I like that. Uh, frequency, I mean, just once, that's not enough to qualify as a compassionate person. It's nice that they did that, but it's gotta be more than that. Looks like there needs to be some persistence, some frequency to one's helping. Okay, so let's add that. If someone frequently helps, but only when it comes to picking up drop papers, they're really weird, first of all. Um, but secondly, are they compassionate? No, right, that's not sufficient either. Students, tell me why not. What's missing here? You can shout out loud. Hey, you're not, hey. come on, students in the back. Come on, come on, you, you, you got it. Not, not since you were saying the wrong thing, but come on, students in the back. Help me out, help me out. What's missing here? What's wrong? What's deficient? Nothing? Generally, very good, I'm look, I was looking for a word like that. Generalization, cross-situational consistency. <laughs> Another word for it. Diversity, it looks like there needs to be some diversity, cross-situation consistency, I like generalization, two ones helping. So let's add that. If someone is being reliably helpful in various situations, okay, reliably over time, in various situations, so cross-situational consistency, but only for purely self-serving reasons like making a good impression on your significant other or putting oneself in a good mood, is that sufficient for being a compassionate person? Head, thumbs down. Come on, come on. No, right? Uh, why not? It, it's, who said it? It's it, genuine. Very nice. Yes. It's not the right kind of motivation you expect of a virtuous person, in this case, a compassionate person. Agreed? Makes sense. To me, at least. It looks like there needs to be some good motivation or virtuous reasons behind one's helping, and these don't count. And there are other ones that don't count either, including things like to get rewards in the afterlife. That may not count either. Um, oh, oh, I forgot where I am, I'm a little nervous about putting that one out there. But, um, <laughs> but look, we can talk about that too, if you like. Um, there are some uh, Christian motives that would not perhaps count as virtuous either. So now, with that in mind, uh, I want to build from this example to a broader account of what it is to be a virtue. Now, I'm not going to be able to do too much with this tonight. I don't want to make this the focus of the talk, so it's going to be pretty quick. But it's going to do the work that I need to do for our time together. So in general, not just compassion, but if moral virtues across the board, I think they look like something like this. They lead to behavior that is morally admirable. It better be morally admirable. That would be strange if it wasn't. In a diverse range of situations relevant to the virtue, we talked about that. So we got that cross-situational consistency element to the virtue. Stably over time, we also talked about that. It can't just be I picked up the papers today or I did these other nice things today and never again. We have stability over time and primarily for good and admirable reasons and motives. Maybe it didn't have to be exclusively. You have mixed motives. Maybe you have some self-interested motivation in there too. 
the better, I think, better, better be primarily for good and admirable reasons and motives. Sound okay? If not, tell me in the Q&A. You already start formulating your questions if you want. Write them down. I'm not claiming this is sufficient. I'm claiming these are necessary. Uh, perhaps there's more that needs to be added to this list. Maybe we need to bring in practical wisdom. Maybe need, something needs to be said about the manner in which you engage in this behavior. So uh, that there's more to do here. But these are at least four big ones for me, for a moral virtue. Other questions could arise here. What are the primarily, I'm uh, sorry, the good and admirable motives and reasons? Do egoistic or self-interested reasons ever count? No, there's the answer. Okay, that's easy. Um, do dutiful reasons ever count? We can talk about that if you like. Do the uh, altruistic reasons ever count? We can talk about that too. That would be a lot of fun to talk about. But I'm going to leave this open-ended for now. So there's the philosophy. If you're not a philosophically inclined, it's over. We're done with. Uh, we'll move on to something else now. If you're more empirically inclined, here's your chance. Part two, how good is our character? So I've understood character in terms of virtues and vices. So I'm going to say how virtuous is our character? Do we tend to have the virtues? I'm going to treat these questions relatively interchangeably. Well, what do you think? Don't shout out, but ask the question to yourself first. What's your own answer? Trigger warning coming up. It's going to be depressing. Sorry, it's going to be a depressing story that you're about to hear. If you're looking for a lot of good, positive stuff coming out of this talk after dinner, after such a good meal in your stomach, um, I'm not going to deliver that for you. For most of us today, our character is not virtuous at all. Most of us today do not have any of the moral virtues. <clears throat> I don't know why they invited me to do this after dinner talk. Um, <laughs> if they wanted an uplifting speaker, they had to get someone else. They should have had you, you do it or something. Um, uh, but that's just the reality as far as I understand the facts on the ground. Um, I can't change those facts. That's just where the truth leads me, leads me. How did I come to that conclusion? Well, I could come to it in a variety of different ways. I think on Christian grounds, that's a plausible conclusion. That's what you would expect. Uh, I think if you look at historical um, research, patterns of behavior throughout history, this is much you might expect. If you look at current events, what you might expect, the news, that kind of thing. But I didn't know that. Uh, I did not look at any of those sources for my project here. I instead looked at the best psychological research I could find. So I spent a lot of time going back uh, through social psychology, personality psychology, other uh, kinds of psychological research dating back to really to the 1950s, mainly 1960s was the starting point I, I used, and just saw you know, what did the best studies, according to my opinion at least, of uh, best studies, tell me about things like whether people cheated or not, lied or not, stole or not, helped or not, hurt or not, in a variety of different situations, and very carefully controlled behavioral studies of participants. So this uh, was what uh, I spent a lot of time doing, which led up to the two books that were mentioned, the two academic books in 2013, 2014. There's no way I could do that tonight. Or maybe I could uh, review some of those studies for you tonight, but you really don't want me to do that. So what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of a taste of that research with two examples, two studies that I really uh, I think are important and interesting and help make the point. Don't come away from this talk tonight thinking, wow, I heard this speaker give me two studies and then draw these huge grandiose conclusions about no one's virtuous or very few people are virtuous. Uh, trust me, I did more than that, OK? Uh, but I can only do so much in our time together. So here's one of them. How many of you know this study? Very the classic study in psychology. 1969, one of the first bystander effect studies. Here's the setup. Um, you're a participant, you're going into the lab. The person in charge says, come into this room, I want you to fill out the survey. You say, sure, I go into the room, sit down, you're given the survey, you're given a pen or pencil, you start working on the survey. A few minutes later, here comes someone else, a stranger to you, who looks like they're also volunteering for this, the study. They come in, they sit down, they're given the same materials, they start working at the uh, survey, same survey at the table next to you, or same table, I'm not sure exactly what. A little bit later, the two of you are working away. The person in charge has left, gone to the next room, and this happens. If they were listening carefully, 
Participants heard her climb up on a chair to get a book from the top shelf. If they were not listening carefully, they heard a large, a loud crash and a woman scream as the chair fell over. Oh my God, my foot, cried the representative. I, I can't move it. Oh, my ankle, I can't get this thing off me. What would you do if you heard that? If you were the one that was taking the survey, what would you do? Check it out. You would do something, right? You would help, right? Whether you would call out, you'd pull out your cell phone in 1969, that might have been hard, um, and you would go into the next room or something to help. Well, now we introduce, you kind of see what's going to happen next. We introduce this wrinkle. You're in the room filling out the survey. The person that's with you does nothing. They just keep working on the survey. If that's the case, it's very likely you will do nothing as well. Now, it's a little bit different because you've heard about the study, so you're kind of primed to think differently. But if that was you, naive, walking into this study, you would very likely do nothing yourself. How unlikely? That unlikely. In the original study, only 7% of participants helped. 93% did nothing. Um, there was another version in which, uh, in that case, the, the, the participant was alone. There was no other survey taker. And in that version, 70% helped. Okay, so the 70 versus 7. I still wonder about that 30% that didn't help. I don't know what they were thinking when they were alone, but you know, again, I don't think there's a lot of virtue. So um, this has been replicated many times. Uh, different variations too, a man having an electric seizure, maintenance worker falling off a ladder, a man crying out in pain from a serious electric shock, a stream of smoke coming into the room. <laughs> if I had more time, I could have been clever and, and rigged something up here. And, have some smoke coming out of the kitchen or something and see what you would have, all would have done. Because you would have been so enraptured by the talk and like, oh, the smoke, that's probably nothing. And so the room would have filled up. Um, thief steal cash from a receptionist envelope. Young man steal a case of beer. And that one, which is uh, worst of all. So that's one study. Again, I'm not generalizing from that or making any grandiose conclusions from that study. That's just one small piece of evidence for me that I use to build a broader picture about uh, what our character is actually like. Shifting gears, that was a study pertaining to helping or not helping, so I think under the, the rubric of, or under the heading of compassion. Here's one that has to do with honesty, or in this case, we're gonna see dishonesty. Much more recent as well, 2011. Anyone know this one? Uh, this is less familiar. So participants complete a worksheet with 20 problems. They would be paid 50 cents per correct answer. Sounds pretty good. In a control condition, participants knew that the experimenter checked the answers and oversaw payments. So the key thing here is that there was no opportunity to cheat. You went in, you took the test, you tried your best. If you wanted to get that monetary reward, you turn in your answers, and you got paid accordingly. Let's see what the next, the other variation is going to be. We're going to call it the shredder condition. Participants knew that their answers would not be checked. Their worksheets would be shredded, and their payment would be based entirely on what they told the experimenter with no questions asked. That wouldn't make a difference, would it? I mean, you know, people would just be as, uh, they would be about the same as a control group, right? You want me to sell you some real estate, too? Uh, I wouldn't bet on that any day. Here's the no opportunity to cheat. Eight problems answered correctly. That's the baseline. So we need to know what the baseline result is. How much more do you think it's going to be in the shredder condition? 8.5? 9, 9.5, 10? Higher? We want to go up more? Ooh, someone was close. Whoever said 14, you're very close. 13.22 problems answered correctly. So about double. All right? Now you might think, well, that was so, I mean, that could be explained in other ways. I mean, it could be explained by the fact that this group was just so much smarter, right? And they were so much better at the test. And again, if you believe that, I've got plenty of real estate to sell you as well. I mean, it's, it's possible, right? That could be what's going on. But I think we know what the more likely and more plausible explanation is. These participants saw an opportunity to cheat, and they took advantage of it. So this doesn't reflect well on their honesty. Again, I'm not saying that proves anything. It's just a small piece of data. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of other studies having to do with cheating. I look at them collectively and draw inferences from the entire body of empirical research, such as it is today. Okay.
Enough about that. Here's my conclusion again. When I read hundreds of studies in moral psychology like these, I conclude that experimental evidence does not show the patterns of virtuous behavior and virtuous motivation. You need both that I would expect if we were virtuous people. So I conclude that most of us are not good people. Now, one reaction I might have is, uh, yeah, that's not, nothing new. I mean, I, that, no surprise. Uh, who would have thought that otherwise? But at least we have now a lot of empirical evidence backing up that claim. If you want to get into the nitty gritty of this, uh, without having to spend the time of reading hundreds of studies, I commend to you these two books, uh, the 2013 and 2014. They have nothing to do with animals, uh, at, despite what the titles might lead you to expect. Uh, that's actually my mother's artwork. Uh, those are not pictures, those are paintings. And so even though they had nothing to do with the content of the book, I took advantage of a chance to feature her artwork um, because I don't claim that virtue myself either, so uh, <laughs> no, just, it was a good chance to show off my mother's work. So it really has nothing to do with um, the, the content of the book itself. So don't, don't get distracted by the cover. Um, so there you go. That's where I tried to establish that conclusion based on the empirical research such that it was at the time when I wrote those books. All right. This leaves us with, I think, a pretty big character gap. The gap between our actual character, see if this works, yes, our actual character down here, and the virtuous character we should have. So we put the two parts of the talk together. Philosophy and theology have a lot to say about this. We have normative standards of what kind of person we should be. Psychology and some other empirical fields have a lot to say about this, the kind of character we actually have. We put those two together, we see there's a significant gap between the two. Uh, character gap, hence the title of the, the recent book, The Character Gap. Okay, so we doing okay? Hanging in there? Got one thumbs up? Oh, wow, more. All right, all right, all right. lots of thumbs up. Good, good. Whether you're honest or not, I don't know, but I appreciate it. It makes, it makes me feel better, so that's important. Third part, um, and we're doing good on time, excellent, excellent. So, like I said, this is the really the, the central part for me. Some, what I've already presented is kind of older work. Uh, this is taking the older work and now trying to apply it in a very practical and relevant manner. I'm interested, of course, in cultivating good character in general. I have three kids, so it's very, very, very relevant. Um, I don't have a virtuous character myself, so it's also very relevant in that sense. Uh, um, I look at society, it looks like we need to cultivate good character in general in society, but integrating this into the theme of the conference, I want to focus on cultivating good character in students, and by students I mean here, college students. Okay, so I really want to now tie this into what we're doing here this weekend. So I'm going to make a couple more assumptions at this point. Assuming that cultivating good character is a good thing, can't always, I mean, that's, that's, that is an assumption, somewhat controversial, uh, not so much to me, but but some people debate that. So I'm just gonna assume it, we can talk about it if you like in the Q&A. Uh, I've got several arguments for why it's a good thing. And also assuming that good, cultivating good character in students is a good thing. So it might be that cultivating good character in general is a good thing, but that is not a good thing in the university context. Maybe it should be done primarily at home or in church context or in other contexts, but it should be off limits in the university context. I'm not going to hold that view, though. I'm going to assume both of these things are true uh, and say that uh, cultivating good character in students is a good thing. Okay. So before we get into actual strategies for how to do that, two preliminary things. Should we intentionally promote virtue in general in schools or just focus on a few specific virtues? So I think that there's some interesting strategic questions. And the we here could be a university administrators. It could be... Uh, faculty, uh, could be campus ministry organizations, lots of different weeds. I'm mainly going to be assuming it's faculty. Most of the people around this, this uh, room are faculty. I'm a faculty member, so, but it needn't be faculty. So strategically, which way would you go? I think it's better to go the second way. Uh, I'm, I'm nervous about just trying to promote virtue in general. I don't know how far that's going to take us. Uh, a nebulous or general notion of virtue, how much we're going to move the needle there. I'm also nervous about trying to hit a lot of virtues over the course of four years, like uh, virtue of the month. You know, November is going to be courage month. Uh, December is going to be fortitude month. Uh, January is going to be temperance month. I'm nervous about how that much that actually accomplishes, how much you move the needle there. 
So I think the approach, at least that I want to consider or recommend, is just focusing strategically on a few specific virtues and trying to make some progress during the course of four years uh, in, in undergraduate context. Well, then it invites the question, well, which ones? Right? There's a, a, a long list. Depends also, of course, on which list you look at. In the positive psychology context, if you look at the, the VIA list, you've got 24 character strengths. So I would think we need to pick and choose. Here are some criteria you might want to think about in this context, ones that are especially relevant to the college years. Uh, some maybe are more relevant to later in life as opposed to the college years. Some that are easier to get buy-in, to promote them from relevant parties. So depending on the institution, something like chastity might be a little hard to get some buy-in on, even though it might be really important to the college years. Might be like meet the first criteria, one of the central virtues we're thinking about uh, the college years, but it might be hard on the second criteria to get buy-in on the virtue of chastity. And then the third one, at a place like Baylor at least, uh, those that are central to Christian thinking about character. So in my university or a secular university, that criteria wouldn't come into play, but at a place like Baylor, it can. So what some candidates might be things like theological virtues, uh -huh, right? Honesty, compassion, perseverance, and open-mindedness as well uh, could be some candidates. I don't mean to limit it to that. I'm just giving you some examples of good possibilities, I think, that might be interesting to explore. So with that in mind, if you're up for it, I'm going to try and do a whirlwind through six different strategies. You might be thinking, oh my gosh, after all we've done today, after the nice dinner, after Harry hearing this guy for a while, he wants to do six strategies. You can leave. That's okay. You won't offend me. Um, but I'm going to try and see if we can get through these. I think they're all interesting. I won't uh, try and spend too much time on them, though, out of interest of time. <clears throat> these strategies can be implemented in all kinds of ways. We uh, at Wake Forest have an entire class on character at the freshman level. It's not required, but it's an optional class you can take just on character. Next semester, I'm teaching an upper level class on character. It may be that instead there are components of a different course, like an introduction to philosophy or introduction to theology, maybe have a character component where you might want to use one of these strategies or multiple strategies. Maybe you want to squeeze them in in some way in 10 minutes. And of course, it needn't be limited to the classroom as you nicely point out in a talk this afternoon, uh, it may be that a lot of this is best implemented outside the classroom in extracurricular context. I'm going to focus today primarily in the classroom, but I don't think we have to limit it to that. All right. Ready to go? Still hanging in there? Not fewer thumbs up. <laughs> We're still okay? Yes? Good? Awake? All right. Excellent. Here's the first one. More reminders. So the idea is to encourage students to use regular moral reminders that serve to make their moral commitment salient and thereby work against their pursuing, solely pursuing their own self-interest. So the assumption is that students and people in general know a heck of a lot about morality already, but that those moral rules and principles and guidelines may not always be psychologically salient and so may get swamped by other considerations, say, of self-interest. And so if you can bring those uh, uh, more considerations to mind, make them more psychologically salient, they can be powerful in guiding motivation and behavior. There are different ways to do this. There are all kinds of uh, tricks and, and strategies you can do to implement this idea. I'm just going to focus on one example, though, uh, with respect to honesty and the honor code. So you have an honor code here at Baylor. Yes? Uh, students have to sign it at every, for every test. Oh, we've got st Baylor students. Okay. I didn't see you come in. Yes. Uh, do you have to sign the honor code for every test? There's some controversy about this. Uh-oh. This is not a good sign. Um, we got half saying yes and half saying no. Um, you know, we better or, or work that out. Um, uh, how about for papers? No. OK. Um, so my uh, suggestion is to have a very robust honor code that's implemented in all kinds of grading contexts. By that, I mean uh, when there's a t any kind of test, the honor code is used before the test. At Wake Forest, we have such an uh, honor code where you have to sign the honor code before taking the test. And I actually make my students verbally recite it with me before they sign it. So we all sing the honor code. No, sing it, but, but we all say it together. Uh, and then they sign the honor code, and then they take the test. Uh, for papers, when I was at Princeton uh, as an undergrad, 
we had to handwrite the honor code and then sign it at the end of the paper. Uh, so that's an, another way to do it. And this seems to make a difference. I mean, it's, it sounds nice in theory. Is there any empirical backing to it? Let's go back to those shredder studies. There, this is an interesting tie-in to one of the studies we've already looked at. So here, this was by a different team of researchers. They gave a different version of the test. So you can see this was harder. People were only getting 3.4 correct out of 20 on this version. Shredder condition 6.1, it doubles again. Interesting why isn't it 20? You can ask me about that if you want, or a lot higher. If you're gonna cheat, why not go all the way? This is a very interesting question, we can talk about that. This is what I want to highlight though. In this version, they had the participants, different participants of course, there's no overlap in the conditions. They had the participants first sign their university's honor code, then they were in the shredder condition. Graded the test themselves, verbally reported how many they got correct, and as you can see, there was almost no cheating in this group. Powerful result. What if we try to up the stakes a little bit, make it $2, I mean 50 cents, $2, that's a lot more. Control condition, shredder condition, uh, honor code condition. Didn't make a difference. So that's pretty interesting. Again, it's just one study needs to be replicated. We want to see a lot more empirical backing to it. Here are a couple other quick results. 28% College students at schools without an honor code reporting, helping another person on a test versus 9% of schools with an honor code. Plagiarism, 18% versus 7. Unauthorized crypt notes, 21% versus 9. Unpermitted collaboration, 39% versus 21. Oops, sorry, went too fast. 39% uh, uh, versus 21%. So what's the idea here? This is an example of a moral reminder strategy. The honor code functions as a moral reminder, making our moral norms salient, which then in turn can curb or completely eliminate cheating. Okay, that's the first one. Again, I'd love to dwell a lot on these, and there's a lot more to say, but I think I want to uh, try and cover several of them uh, in, in our time together. You can guess what this one is going to do. Second one is moral role models. Here's a role model of honesty. Here's a role model of courage. Here's a not very well known, uh, but I wish uh, much more widely known role model of compassion. This is Leopold Socha. Uh, I talk about him a lot in the Character Gap book. During World War II, he protected 20 Jews uh, for over a year during the Nazi occupation of his town in Poland. And how did he protect them? By hiding them in the sewer system that he, as a sewer uh, official, was responsible for. And how, what did that look like? That looked like him crawling on his hands and knees every day for over a year through the filthy sewer pipe to bring those people bread and water to keep them alive. It's an outstanding, I mean, an astounding story, uh, incredible exemplar of compassion and many other virtues as well. So what's the idea here? These are people who we can admire, and I think we do, do naturally admire for their good characters. And not just a matter of admiration, it's also a matter of emulation. So I admire all kinds of things. It doesn't really change me very much. I admire you know, how well a team did at the, at the Olympics, but I don't turn around and go out and start training for the Olympics. Um, but the, in these cases, the hope is that you admire them, which turns into a desire to emulate them, to have my own character better reflect their character, rather than bringing their character down to my level, have my character uh, uh, rise up to their level as much as it can. Not in every way, of course, these were not saints across the board, but in the ways that count for developing good character. Okay, so what's this have to do with students? How can this be used in a more uh, university context? So encourage students to seek out virtuous role models and exemplars. This could be in an extracurricular uh, context, but how about in the classroom context? Well, you could have students research and ideally interview a relevant and attainable exemplar of courage or pick your whatever virtue you're focused on with an emphasis on the student's emotional responses to learning about the exemplar's courage. And there's a lot packed into that sentence. <clears throat> Research, maybe it's a distant historical exemplar, so that's the best you can do. But maybe it's someone in the present, maybe someone at Baylor. You could actually sit down and interview. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, the most exemplary person I met was the person who cleaned my dorm at Princeton. No offense to my professors, and fellow students, but this person was was closest thing to a saint I came across in four years there. 
So that would be an example of someone I could have interviewed uh, with an emphasis on the, on the emotional responses to that person's mind. So notice a couple factors that matter here. Relevance, there's, there's psychological research backing this up, by the way. If you want it, I can uh, send it to you. Attainable and emotional connection. Pretty intuitive. I don't think I need to explain and unpack what, what that means. Uh, those factors make a difference. OK, so that's strategy number two. Trying to move really quickly here to the time. I'm going to combine three and four. Thumbs up. Um, educating about virtue and practicing virtue together. So here the idea, first of all, educating about virtue, just actually increasing knowledge and familiarity with virtue concepts. So I find that a lot of students today are just unacquainted with a lot of the stuff we're talking about at this conference. A lot of these words are unusual to them, unfamiliar to them, that more seem more antiquated, historical. You talk about things like graciousness or gratitude or fortitude. I mean, what do these things mean? They're, 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 not, they're not part of the, the ordinary discourse on, on Facebook or Snapchat, I can assure you that. Um, so increase their acquaintance with the concepts of virtue, character, and the particular virtues, thereby becoming mindful of what a virtuous life is supposed to look like. So that's the more theoretical piece. And then there's the actually practicing piece. So practicing the virtuous behavior since virtues are acquired by habituation. Now, of course, behavior is insufficient. We talked about motivation as well, but at least it's a central part. It's a big, important piece. And so that's the practicing virtue strategy. OK, what might this look like more concretely? Take a virtue like gratitude, have students read about what gratitude is. I plan to do this next semester in my, my class. We'll have some readings about it just to get more familiarity with this concept. In a, in a, in a, depending on the school, you can have readings with biblical examples. And then have students keep a weekly gratitude journal. So some of you are probably familiar with this research from Emmons. Uh, it looks like this practice significantly moves the needle on people's gratitude, in particular students, he usually has student participants in his research, uh, moves the needle on their gratitude, the dispositional gratitude, over time. So uh, check out that, that's of interest. This is a, a practical way to implement this strategy so as to practice virtuous behavior with the goal of cultivating the virtue. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one, self-control. Have students read about what self-control is, temperance, if you want to use that word. That's another one, temperance. That's a, it's not going to be very familiar to a lot of students today, at least maybe at Baylor, sorry. I shouldn't generalize. You all are, are very sophisticated and, and well-informed about character, but uh, I'm not so sure about a lot of other schools. Um, so, and then here's the practical side. Write a plan for developing self-control. This is what's done in that class at Wake Forest I mentioned, which freshmen can take. This is one of their assigned assignments. It was one of the tasks they have to do. Uh, as part of the graded work in the class. It's a develop a plan for, well, write a plan for developing self-control, perhaps with a, respect to a few areas of real weakness, weakness, and then later report back to the professor how well they did at implementing the plan, what were their failures, what were their successes, and then you could also do some kind of assessment at the end, and at the beginning to see if uh, there was some real progress made. So is that, is that clear? Making sense? All right. Almost there, we're almost at the end. Uh, strategy five, identifying character flaws. You're going to see here these strategies need not be compartmentalized. They're going to bleed into each other. Uh, maybe it would be better to combine them. But I at least want to highlight this uh, for its own sake. Here the idea is encourage students to develop greater understanding about their own character flaws and limitations. They can learn about situational influences and cognitive biases that can encourage non-virtuous behavior and serve as, psych as whoops, psychological impediments to virtue. Sorry, bad typo. Um, now, we, you know, you, we were doing a little bit of that in the last part, the self-control, identifying some of your flaws and trying to work on them. But here, the idea is to be very intentional in helping students identify their own flaws so that they can work on them. And that intentionality may need to, or uh, maybe it needs too strong, could involve learning about flaws that the students don't even recognize themselves. Looking at empirical literature, which has illustrated for us 
that there are unconscious or subconscious ways in which we fall short of virtue. Let me illustrate. So this is the idea, I'll expand a little bit more. So students can be more mindful about their character flaws, and work to compensate or correct them. And here's an example of the bystander effect. Right? So how many of you would have expected people to not help when that person in the next room is screaming in pain? Right? Most of you would have expected, I asked you, like, what would you have done? What do you, I didn't ask you the question what, what most people have done, but I bet you would have said, if I'd asked you, what would most people have done? You would have said, most people would have helped. Turns out it depends, right? So now we learn something from the psychological research that helping in group contexts, well, it's more complicated than we might have thought. And we might have expected us and others to rise to the occasion and help, but not necessarily, right? There are some real psychological impediments that we might have recognized in our own psychology that can hold us back. Things like fear of embarrassment and diffusion of responsibility. And the psychological research could help illuminate that for us so that we can be more mindful of flaws like this. And when in situations like someone's screaming, someone needs help in a group context, I can be more mindful of the impact of my fear of embarrassment and holding me back and work against it. Okay. Let me develop that a little bit more, give you a study as well. I wish there were more studies supporting this. There are very few as far as I know. This one's a cool one that I like to use a lot. From 1978, students heard a social psychology lecture explaining how groups can inhibit helping. So there you go, classroom environments, talking about something that bears on the student's character, right? Did it make a difference? Well, at least it did in this study. So later that day, they were presented with a stage emergency and a non-responsive body center. It's pretty cool. Uh, so let's see what happens. Did the lecture make a difference? Sure did. How many helps in the original study that I gave you earlier? Ah, very good, okay. Some people are still awake, some people are, are still, uh, still recalling back, all the way back then. Um, seven, now 67. In this, they did have the control condition as well for those participants who did not hear the lecture. So 27, it's not the same as seven, but look at the difference. That's the key thing to take away from this. 27% versus 67%, that's a huge difference. Now you might say to yourself, okay, Miller, hold on, hold on, hold on, don't get too excited about this. I mean, after all, it was the same day, right? I mean, this was a stage emergency, the same day they heard the lecture. How many times is that ever gonna happen in life, right? You hear, like the professor gives a lecture on this ethical topic on the very same day, the lecture is very applicable. I don't know, maybe it happens to you, but probably didn't happen to me very much. Um, so these, lecture, these uh, researchers were pretty clever. They thought about this point too. So they did a second study where the emergency occurred two weeks later instead. Okay, so did the effect of the lecture persist? It did, to some extent, right? Not as pronounced. 25% versus 42%, but still, you're gonna take it? I'll take that. I mean, if my lectures ever had that much impact, I would be thrilled, right? I mean, I ask my students, like, you know, I'll, I'll come back to wake on, and on Tuesday, I'll ask them, you know, what did we talk about last week? And it's like, silence. Like, uh, let, me, let me get my notebook out, and let's go like, look back over the notes. So look, if my, if my lectures had that kind of impact, I'd be thrilled, even though it's not 100%, still, that's pretty impressive. All righty. Okay, well, yeah, good. Just about wrapping up on time. Um, last one, I promise, we're almost done. <laughs> Seems fitting in this kind of context uh, to mention this strategy. I wouldn't in other kind of context, but it seems appropriate here. Christian practices strategy, this is the sixth one. So encourage students to gauge, engage in Christian practices which have character improvement as a byproduct, even if it's not the main goal. Okay, so first we need to clarify what this difference is between goal versus byproduct. I'll use an example to clarify that. Take worship and humility. I assume that the goal of worship is not to make yourself a better person. Right. Maybe you're worshiping yourself, I don't know. But uh, I mean, I assume the worship, the goal of, at least one goal of worship is other directed, centered on God and the person you're, you're worshiping. 
But, so that's the goal. But a byproduct, a side effect of that could be growing in humility. So you're putting yourself in a position of subordination to a higher being. You're giving glory and, and worshiping that higher being. You're saying that this higher being you know, is, is lord of your life and is the, the ruler of your life. That's all the kind of thing that can foster humility. You would expect a prideful person to do that. So the idea is you know, a, a Christian practice like worship can have all kinds of beneficial character effects, even if the goal of the practice is not the beneficial character effects. They can be byproducts instead of goals. So uh, I think that's very important to emphasize. Here's another example, prayer and gratitude. Of course, you might pray to increase your level of gratitude, but how many of you do that? Like, how often do we have our prayers be, Lord, increase my gratitude? So maybe, I don't know, I don't know. I'm speaking for myself. Maybe I'm a bad uh, Christian, but or something like that. I don't pray for that very much, right? Um, but in the process of praying for other things, I might also increase in gratitude. You get the idea, right? So we look at Christian practice, Christian practice, fasting, uh, go down the line of, of the different ones, um, and no tithing if you want to uh, do that one. And we can see that there are virtues that are naturally linked to that practice, even if they aren't the goal of the practice. So the more we might engage in these practices in a well-intentioned way, the more we might grow in virtue, and that same, I think, would apply to, to uh, students. So that's the, the connection here, the last strategy, uh, Christian practice. One more illustration of this, service activities and compassion. <laughs> a little bit more detail on this. So maybe I'll, I won't spend a lot of time on this, just to wrap up. Um, but the idea is here, so we can encourage participation. I mean, there Baylor students, lots of service activities going on Baylor, I assume, right? So you're encouraged, not required, I assume, not required to engage in service activities, but you're very encouraged, strongly encouraged. Uh, the goal of the service activities is presumably not to grow in your own character. It's to help the people in need, right, and to benefit others. It's altruistic uh, for the sake of other people. But a side effect, a byproduct of that, can be to grow in compassion. That's the third illustration. And to grow in compassion, we need to have selfless, altruistic motivation. And it develops selfless, altruistic motivation. We need empathy. There's a lot to cover at the very end. Um, so we need to find ways to empathize better with those who are in need. And so we can look for all kinds of strategies to encourage students to be more empathetic towards those who are in need when they engage in service activities, which thereby can foster compassion. And there's some interesting research uh, out there right now, empathy-inducing text messages, uh, and with the inducing instructions for engaging in the service projects, uh, that can be very helpful and relevant here. So I think I'll pass over that rather quickly to wrap up. So stepping back, bigger picture, we went through the six strategies. Some questions for you. Do any of these strategies sound promising? I hope so. I hope some of them do. I hope, I hope all of them do. Uh, but what's your personal view? Are you uh, maybe not so keen on some of them? I'd love to hear that. Which ones you think are promising, which ones are not? And are there other promising approaches besides these? I don't claim that these are the only ones. So I'd love to hear what other ones are out there. I think there are other ones uh, that we should take seriously too. But I'd love to hear your input on that question as well. So I'll leave you those two questions. I'll say thank you. And I really uh, welcome your feedback and uh, um, continuing this conversation. So thank you very much. So I think the plan is to use the microphones again, just like last night, uh, and I'm going to field the questions. Uh, so I'll just call on people. And even though you don't have the virtue of courage, you can still try to develop your virtue of courage by coming up. It's a good strategy. Please, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm cultivating the virtue of courage. There you go. There you go. Um, and you're exemplar, too. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so it strikes me that at least a couple of the strategies you, des you described uh, fall sort of in the broad arena of something like a nudge in the psychological literature. Yeah, yeah. And as I'm sure you're aware, there's lots of um, efforts to outsource nudges to our technological devices through apps. Uh. And I'm wondering um, just first if you've encountered um, 
any research on the effectiveness that applications have in nudging people to improve their moral character. And then so the follow-up to that is um, just what you think generally about that strategy as opposed to sort of the old school strategy that you described in the, um, yeah. uh, in the cheating example of writing out the code ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, is Sarah here? No, okay. Um, so the reason I ask that is it's a great question and at Baylor you have one of the world's experts on that very question. Uh, so I was gonna see if she was in the audience right now. Uh, so she's doing cutting edge research, trying to develop technological nudges, if you want to call them that, uh, for fostering character improvement. Uh, and they're going to be things like apps on your phone uh, and the like of that. So I'm not the expert on that. I was going to defer to her. Uh, I have seen a few things, though. For example, uh, this work by Sarah Conrath, who's one of the top people working on empathy and compassion in the world today, I, I think. She's at uh, Indiana. Uh, university. And so she did a really fascinating study where she uh, had students receive empathy inducing text messages five, I think it was five times a day during a certain interval of time. And then a significantly later point in time, assessed whether they were more helpful or not compared to a control group which didn't get the empathy inducing text messages and found that indeed they were more helpful. Uh, things, uh, I, I, uh, I don't want to, I can't quote any, but there would be things like, um, uh, take a moment to consider uh, what someone is going through, who you know, um, or try to imagine, uh, try to adopt the perspective of a friend who's going through a difficult time right now. Um, so the idea is it's perspective taking, it's trying to cultivate perspective taking, uh, and it's also trying to get you away from thinking about yourself and take on a perspective of another. Uh, but I can't quote verbatim the, the messages she used, but that, that's the idea. So that, uh, that's preliminary research, but very uh, interesting. I, um, having said that, I'm, uh, these are early days. And I'm very cautious about uh, making any claims about how effective they are in cultivating virtue for a couple of reasons. One, uh, virtue is more than just good behavior. So uh, even if it's true in this study that there was some good behavior demonstrated, of course, we also need it to be cross-situational. That, that doesn't, you know, that's going beyond this study. But we also need to know about the motivation as well. So you can give me a lot of studies telling me that there was better behavior. Maybe you can make a causal claim because of the technology. I still need to know about the motivation before I'm going to make any conclusions about the virtue cultivation. Um, so I think I'm going to give you the weaselly. It's early days and we don't have much at this point. Sorry, yeah. Um, I wish I could say more. And you can find Sarah tomorrow. She can tell you a lot more. Uh, yes. Thanks for a great, great talk. Uh, I have a question about admiration. It seems very plausible that admiration can function in the way you said as a, something that draws us to become more like the people we admire. But it also seems in some cases admiration can be a kind of substitute for virtue, as in the person who says, well, I'm not a racist because I really like or admire Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, or, or uh, Kierkegaard talks about the person who doesn't want to imitate Christ but just admire, be an admirer. I'm great because I admire the good people. What, yeah. Is that a real problem? And do you have any idea about what to do about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, it does seem like a real problem, for sure. Uh, as far as what to do about it, that's a harder question. Um, so the idea behind the exemplar strategy is that uh, my admiration would be the starting point, but it wouldn't be the only elements in the process. So it's admiration combined with emulation. So the examples you gave sound like, yeah, let's assume they really did admire Martin Luther King, for example. That's only one piece of the puzzle. They need to be then go to the next step of emulating Martin Luther King in the relevant respects. It sounds like they're not doing that, right? So it's, it's more just cognitive, theoretical admiration from a, a distance without any emotional bite to it. 
in a way, Haidt talks about the, the, uh, the, the emotion of uh, the elevation, or we could say emulation. Um, so if you have those, both of those pieces together, I think that would help alleviate that problem. Of course, that invites the question of how would you cultivate in someone the emulation piece? If someone is just admiring but not emulating, what could you do to foster their emotional response of emulation? And I, I don't have much to say about, about that. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, yeah, great. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, one of the things I was struck by was, uh, perhaps maybe just put it a little strong, but how theologically barren this uh, approach uh -huh. is. For example, compared to like uh, the book of Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, yeah. the first half of those books is all about theology and your identity, yeah. who you are, then what God has done for you. And then the latter half of the books are all about ethics, you know, what you should do. And so, but there's a real grounding that you have to be immersed in this story that gives you an identity that then yeah. motivates you. I don't see that here. In fact, even on your first example of what to do, yeah. I see priming. I mean, priming doesn't right. seem to me even virtue development. I mean, virtue education in a sense. It's more of, I mean, if you got to keep on priming people, that's not virtue development. You know, when I was at Rice University, had a take-home exam, attempted to cheat on Professor Garside's history exam. It wasn't some concept of Southern honor that kept me from doing it. It was, no, I had to think about, do I really trust God with the future and what's going to happen here? Uh -huh. Right, it's a different kind of reasoning. It's certainly not priming. So I don't know what you have to yeah. say. To yeah, that. yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, so part of it is the audience in question. So when I was thinking of this talk, I wasn't sure what kind of audience I could assume. So I was assuming, I was thinking that there'd be some people in the audience who are teaching at secular schools like I do, uh, where if they're going to be implementing strategies for cultivating virtue in their students, those strategies can't be explicitly. Christian. So I was trying to give an array of strategies that could be used by people from a variety of different uh, pedagogical backgrounds. Um, I, on the other hand, if it's a Christian context, sure, um, I would want to emphasize what you want to emphasize, but I, I was assuming then that we could take that for granted, um, that students would already have that identity at least, I mean, I can't take that for granted. That, that Christian identity, you could take that for granted in the classroom at a place like Baylor, and then what could you add on top of that, um, add to that? So that's that's how I was thinking of the presentation here. Um, on the point about priming, uh, you're right, I mean, the, the first strategy is a priming strategy, for sure. Uh, I don't see that as a, a negative, though. Uh, so in your case, it, you use explicitly Christian reasoning. Uh, in the case of the study I provided, they didn't use that, they used honor code. And yet, empirically, the research is, I mean, that's the powerful effect. So it looks like uh, there can be um, significant um, curbing of cheating going on using a secular priming strategy like that. There's another uh, variation of that very research, where it wasn't the honor code, it was the Ten Commandments. That was used as the prime before the Shredder condition. Some of you are familiar with this. Have you heard me hear this? Yeah. Um, so the idea there was uh, give the participants or this question. Recall as many of the Ten Commandments as you can. They do that. Maybe they don't recall any. It didn't really matter. Um, then take the test, grade it, submit your uh, answers, and get paid accordingly. And in the, the original version of this study, they found that, again, cheating was eliminated. Even, even among atheists. Even right? amongst right. atheists, yeah. So that, again, it plays into what I had in mind here, which is how important was it that it was a religious versus secular prime uh, versus how, much, how important was it was it a moral prime in the first place, right? Um, I didn't, though, use that study. You might think, well, why not mention that during the talk? Because there was a recent uh, attempt to replicate it, and it failed to replicate. Darn. Um, <laughs> very, very disappointing. Uh, massive replication attempt, actually, with 
uh, I think six countries were involved and something like 10 times as many participants and they couldn't replicate the effect. Um, so I, I should be honest about uh, when it doesn't go a certain way too. Yeah, so those are some, some thoughts. Thank you for your question. Hi, I'll go over here. Hello. Hello. Um, first of all, I really appreciate how practical you made your presentation, um, but I do have a question. Sure. In a presentation my colleagues made earlier today, they argued that chapel attendance should be mandatory in order to cultivate external disciplines such as corporate worship. If the university is responsible in part for character development in students, do you believe that the university should make any of the strategies you've listed mandatory, or should they merely be presented as options to students who are interested? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, what, are you coming from here? Or are you at Union? or? I'm from Union, yes. Yeah, okay, okay, great, great, great. Um, uh, you go back and tell your friends, you stuffed the professor. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I, I, think, I think this. Um, first of all, we need to be clear about what kind of university we're talking about, secular, Christian, whatnot. What, what can we assume and what we, can we not assume? Um, so I, the worship one is going to matter what, what kind of school we're talking about. Uh, let's assume it's a Christian university. Uh, Second thing is that we will think about in the classroom versus outside the classroom. Uh, a lot of what I had to talk about here was in the classroom. And there I was actually making it mandatory. So I, I had in mind certain, for example, some assignments, which you, know, you would be assigned the task of keeping a gratitude journal, or you would be assigned the task of doing a self-assessment of one's self-control, where you, one falls short, and then designing a strategy for increasing one's self-control. So I, I'm comfortable, so long as the class is transparent from up, up front. You know, this is the kind of thing we will be doing in this class, and, and you should be aware of that. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with requiring that in the con classroom context. Uh, now, outside the classroom context, I'm, uh, I would say, comfortable with that, too. Uh, we, I think we have to go case by case. What are we talking about? Are we talking about worship? Are we talking about service activities? Are we talking about fasting? Are we talking about tithing? And maybe we have to answer differently depending on the activity. But something like uh, service attendance, um, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, service activities, serv different services, right? Ser as in a religious service, attendance, I'm okay with that. Service activities, I'm okay with that. Some other things like fasting, I, that, I don't know, I'd have to think about that some more. So maybe we have to go case by case. You're welcome to tell me that I'm crazy. No, uh, you're completely fine. Or tell me that I'm right, uh, either way. Nope, you're completely fine. Thank okay. you for answering. Thank you, appreciate it. So. <laughs> oh, yes. Applaud her for... <laughs> other union students uh, and other Baylor students, come on up, come on up. <laughs> yeah, feel free. Yes. Thank you, for, thank you for your talk. And also thank you for your question also because it made me think of, you said, these aren't the only strategies. Right, 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 right. When you mentioned uh, encouraging corporate worship and also wondering whether we should mandate this for students, and then you said, or, I thought the next thing you were going to say was mandate for faculty. Ah. Uh. <laughs> One thing I found is, um, two small examples, we have sacred time at our institution where no class or meeting is permitted to uh, happen. 11.30 to noon, oh. and there's daily mass. You don't have to go to mass, but you can because nothing's planned. Yeah. And I remember our VP of Mission Integration came to my department, Philosophy Theology. Half of us go, um, the other half doesn't. And okay. she came and she said, uh, if you're wondering why the students aren't going, oh, maybe sure. they're wondering why you're not there. Uh, and so she was encouraging us to model ah, for the students. Excellent. But excellent. when I when I do virtue and vice practices with my students, say let's find out how slothful we really are. Let's let's watch. Let's diagnose. Let's treat. Uh, I always do it with my students. And so when I start the day, I'll talk about all of my failings first. Excellent. And so we're all in it together. And I just wanted to mention maybe it's not just for the students, but modeling shows everyone works at this, and then they can sympathize with and not feel like they're being judged by the one person who has all the virtue in the room. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful, yeah. I would, <laughs> I would applaud that too. Uh, 
I didn't touch on that in this talk. I touched on it in other contexts. Uh, how important role modeling is on the part of the professors, the staff, the administration. So not, I wouldn't limit it just to faculty either, right? And then I'm sure you wouldn't either. Uh, the, the people who help in events like this. Um, uh, I want to just say, uh, absolutely agree with what you what you had in mind. Uh, it had manifests in small ways and manifests in big ways. There's in the in philosophy. Here's an example of how it can manifest. It's well known that when you go give talks to different philosophy departments, you get uh, kind of different styles of questions at the Q and A. Sometimes the questions are very positive, and supportive, and, and nice, even if they're pointed. Other times they're aggressive, combative, harsh. Uh, even though the question, the concept of the question might be identical. The manner in which it's delivered differs. What predicts that? Uh, well, what often predicts that when the questions are coming from graduate students is what they see their mentors doing. The graduate students in that department will ask these harsh questions when they see their, their mentors asking those harsh questions, uh, in a, questions in a harsh way, and vice versa. Um, so there's a really a small instance of, uh, uh, illustrating exactly the point you had in mind. Um, so broader lesson then is all what I talked about here, maybe the take home message should be, how can we apply it to ourselves in the first instance? Instead of going right to the students, maybe the take home message should be, how can I think about these strategies? Are any of them helpful for my own process of sanctification, if you want to put it in Christian terms, or in secular terms, my own process of character development. Because that's going to have all kinds of downstream effects in my professional life. Uh, and and a, a, the role modeling, you can talk all you want about role models from history, or from society, or from other contexts. If you're not role modeling it yourself in the classroom, you're going to look like a hypocrite, right? And it, it's not going to have any effect on the students. So, uh, excellent point. Just want to reaffirm what you said. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, your research is very interesting. Did you find any virtues that were an exception to the general rule? Uh, that is, any that were common or at least more common than the others? So, great question. Um, so, if you really want to pin me down, my kind of over the top statements, it would have to be qualified in all kinds of ways. Uh, when I say most people don't have the virtues, I have not been able to check every virtue. Uh, and frankly, there are some virtues for which there's just not a lot of empirical evidence to use to check them. Right, so I don't have a lot of uh, data to draw on. Um, so that doesn't directly answer your question, but I first want to be a little bit more moderate and, and careful of what I was claiming. Right? Uh, of the ones I've looked at in detail, ones like compassion, honesty, non-malevolence, and, and so forth, uh, those I don't see a lot of evidence for their being widespread. In fact, I see the opposite. I see a lot of evidence for them not being widespread. Uh, that's compatible with it turning out that some other virtues, maybe they're, they're more widespread. I haven't found any such virtue yet, but I also want to acknowledge that I haven't canvassed uh, all the virtues that are out there, and we can't re really do a good job with some of them. So take a, make that a little bit more concrete. Um, take, uh, take patience, for example. There's very little I think, careful, good research, empirical research, on patience that would allow me to evaluate whether most people have the virtue of patience or not. So hopefully, hopefully I'm wrong there. You know, hopefully, they, hopefully though, it turns out that a lot of the other virtues I haven't looked at are widespread. I'm skeptical, um, but I want to also acknowledge that I haven't done that work yet. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Be interested if you had any uh, candidates in mind that you think might be more widespread. Anyone? Like, uh, you think, well, that one's probably got a chance. I'd be interested to know what that is. Please. There's some, uh, there's some forward to you. Very good. <laughs> Thank <laughs> um, you for your talk today. I was wondering, um, when you teach in a secular context, how do you encourage the formation of theological virtues in a place where you can't really explicitly 
um, talk about it. Is there a way that you can implicitly? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, um, great question. So there. There are ways in which I can't do it, and then there are small ways in which I might be able to do it, and then the ways in which other people might be able to do it. So, uh, outside of the classroom, there are going to be you know, campus ministry organizations, and uh, you know, organizations like RUF or IVP or so forth, where in those kind of contexts, they're doing a good job. I, I hope you know, uh, they have the space to think and they talk and practice. The theological virtues. Uh, in my setting, it, there are really only two ways I can see where it might come up. One is if a, a student approaches me, all right, informally outside the classroom. So it comes to office hours and says, you know, uh, I'm. I know this is a, a secular university, but I'm a Christian. I would like to talk. Uh, about what ways in which that makes a difference to think about character. I mean, we can have a conversation, we can even take it in a more practical direction along these lines. Uh, the other way is just to introduce the concepts in a more academic setting in a class. Now that doesn't help with the, the practicing, the practicality of it, but at least it helps with one strategy, educating virtue. So to, make, to say what I have in mind, I teach a course called philosophy of Christianity. And in that kind of context, well, you know, students know what the class is, right? It's, it's very transparent what we're gonna be doing in this class. You don't have to be a Christian to take it, and that's not assumed, uh, but it's a space in which you can talk about what Christians believe about character, and what the three theological virtues are, and why they're important from a Christian perspective. So we can do that in an academic context while recognizing that we're treating it more like an academic subject. Uh, and that's that's all I can do in my situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Great, great question. Yeah. I think you were earlier, but if we were on an alternate, oh, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so a lot of what you talked about um, seemed perfect for your class on character. How would you, what strategies of the ones that you mentioned would be great for a seemingly unrelated subject such as math or engineering, yeah. or are there different strategies that you would employ? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't want to just say these would be limited to certain disciplines or certain fields. Uh, that would be an unfortunate. Uh, I think that'd be unfortunate. Although, um, if students were required to take courses in these fields, they would get exposure that way. Uh, so I do have some hope that these strategies could be adapted to other contexts. I don't have a lot to say about how specifically that would work, uh, but let me say a couple things. One, uh, this role modeling idea that we've, we've seen here, it would make sense to say in a physics class, you know, let's go research some role models, uh, but it would still make sense to say the professor, him or herself, could be a role model. Uh, and that could also, hook up to the second idea, which is explicit discussion of some of these concepts. Uh, so, for example, honesty. Uh, in a scientific context, honesty is still going to matter. And so the professor can be a role model of honesty, say in the lab, role modeling, okay, here's an opportunity where we could fudge the data, but we're not going to. So that's going to be role modeled. Uh, here's an opportunity where we could cheat in certain ways, cut some corners, but we're not going to do that. So that could be role model, but then it could also be just explicitly discussed. Uh, here's what it is to be a, an intellectually honest and a morally honest person in the scientific context. So there could be the educating for virtue and there could be the role modeling going on there. Uh, other virtues could come into play too, things like perseverance. Uh, uh, and, and we could talk about, I think, how to strengthen those too. But, but my initial idea is, yes, it's gonna be more limited, more constrained. Um, but I could still see ways in which something like honesty, for example, could be integrated into those, those contexts. Um, I think I need to think a lot more about that, though. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions for me to, to think about here? Um, yeah. So I do need to think more. Thank you. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, 
have trouble going back and forth. Thank you, Dr. Miller, for tonight. Um, bear with me. I'm going to pull a couple things together people have commented on. I've got a question for you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm teaching Greco-Roman history right now, and in one of my Western Civ classes, Marcus really says the soul is died by the color of our thoughts. And that gets me thinking, you know, the Greco-Roman world had these narratives they told each other that esteemed their virtues. Then sat in a, a great talk today about how the American college in the 20th century sort of lost its grounding in a unifying narrative. And so that sort of unhinged things a bit. And then I think about the fact that you, you mentioned earlier that your students don't always know even what the virtues are, uh. let alone recognize them. So I guess my question for you is, in a secular age in which we don't necessarily have a lot of narratives we share anymore, do you see any hope for um, thoughts in common um, that we might begin to share as a culture to lead us to this conversation of virtue, both in the secular and the, the sort of religious academy? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I bet the speaker last night had a lot of thoughts about those, uh, along those lines. Um, it's it's going to be hard if the virtues are specific, if certain the virtues interested are specific to certain kind of contexts or traditions, like the theological virtues. That's going to be hard if there's this fragmentation that we're seeing now. There might be more hope if you think that there are other virtues that trans. Send traditions, sorry, making a lot of noise here, uh, uh, that you think are fairly universal across traditions. Uh, something like honesty, for instance. You might think, okay, there's one where across religious traditions and across the religious secular divide, you find honesty showing up again and again. On lists of the top five virtues, honesty always shows up as the one people care about uh, time and again. Uh, so maybe we can kind of fixate on certain particular virtues, and then we can think, okay, are there uh, contexts in which students and children are going to be exposed to this virtue? Even if it's not explicitly using the word honesty, the, the ideas are going to get, get transmitted. And there, uh, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, there are going to be kind of children's books, uh, children's stories, movies, um, uh, uh, and, and the like where you will see those themes of honesty and dishonesty explored in a relatively consistent way. Uh, praising, I hope at least, I hope they are, praising uh, someone who is honest, who doesn't cheat, lie, steal, and for the right reasons, and uh, doing the opposite towards the dishonest person. Uh, so I guess uh, to sum that up, um, uh, we have to maybe go virtue by virtue and see what kind of commonalities we can find. And I'm optimistic for some virtues and I'm pessimistic for other virtues. Uh, does that make any sense? It does. Yeah. And so I, I guess just a quick follow-up, because that kind of jogged my thinking. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe we actually, honestly, we do do in our own narratives. Now that I think about it, you, I think of sitcoms, and whenever a spouse is dishonest, you know something bad's coming. Right, you right, know right. dishonesty's got its consequences. And so it makes me wonder what something like the Avenger series, what virtues are those extolling, and what virtues are we talking about as a culture, but we're just not talking about them in sort of a, a typically philosophical way. Yeah, 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 sense. sure, sure. So, so then there can be value in taking these widely um, experienced cultural artifacts and trying to draw out their, their virtue content from them. So you might go through the Avengers series and not explicitly think about the, the virtues, but there might be a lot of content that could be mined uh, for good reflection on things like, uh, like courage, for, for instance. I think there would be plenty there. Um, selflessness, heroism. Uh, I have to think more about Avengers in particular. I had not actually thought about that one. But, uh, but, but the idea seems to, to, to work, right? Uh, there's a difference between it being latent in the cultural artifact and then explicitly drawing it out and reflecting on it and, uh, and calling it to attention, right? And then uh, showing how important it is in its own right, apart from the cultural artifact. Uh, that seems valuable to me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, so, Yes. Fellow Notre Damer. Yeah, this is really <laughs> instructive, Christian. Um, I thought you might be more pessimistic than you were. You know better than I do that <laughs> About what? a lot of people draw from the social psychological literature yeah. uh, the conclusion that in the nature of the case, there aren't uh, these diachronic, stable, yeah. situationally yeah. flexible yeah. Uh, traits. Good. You, yeah. 
have a number of strategies which you say the aim of is producing these traits. Is yeah. this yeah. defiant hope? Do you have, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you show some diachronic effects. You know, you could uh, prime and then two weeks later yeah. you're still yeah. having an effect. But, right. Uh, and it may just be the paucity of the data. Are you just keeping hope alive, or do you have some reasons to hope that, uh, <laughs> that this is uh, a thing? Yeah, great, great, great. Um, so how much time do we have? Uh, oh, OK, not, we have nine minutes. Um, I can say a lot about this. So the first two books were a lot about this. Um, two parts to this. First, uh, what do I think the empirical story is about our actual character? And then second, what reason do I have to hope that virtue can and will be cultivated. Um, so I said that most people don't have the virtues. That's my reading of the empirical literature, the, or what the empirical literature tells us. Uh, if you wanted me to be a little bit more careful about that, most people in the West, because participants are Western participants, uh, don't have the virtues, at least the ones that have been empirically assessed. Uh, so I'll give you those qualifications. That doesn't tell us anything about what actually is going on. So if we're, if we're not like this, well, what's the true story? What is going on instead? And there's a lot of debate about that. So it turns out in philosophy, and maybe in theology too, most people accept the idea that most people don't have the virtues. That's a, a commonly held conclusion on different grounds. They arrive at that conclusion. Where a lot of the debate is, is about what the alternative way of thinking is. Is it? So here's some options. Most people have the vices. You want, to, so there's a pessimist, you want to be pessimistic, there you go. Most people are vicious. Here's another uh, alternative. Most people are continent in Aristotle's sense. They have strength of will, but they don't have virtue. Here's another alternative. Most people are incontinent. Uh, they have weak, weakness of will, but they don't have the vices. Here's another alternative. Uh, character doesn't exist at all. So don't be, most people don't have any characters whatsoever, because character is an illusion. Here's another alternative. Uh, people have local character traits. These are things like uh, honesty just in test-taking situations, or courage just on the battlefield. That's different from courage, right? We talked about cross-situational consistency, and students got, all, got that you know, nailed down. Um, so maybe we just have these very fragmented virtues like that. All these alternatives are bad alternatives, um, in my view. Don't accept any of those alternatives. Uh, they are just as empirically falsified as the claim that most people have the virtues. Now, there's no way I'm going to try and uh, argue that. A lot of the, the product of the two books was to argue that. So I don't think any of those alternatives are true. The one that I think is the case is something like this. Most people have what I call mixed character traits. Uh, so these are character traits which are cross-situationally consistent and stable over time, but are neither good enough to count as virtues nor bad enough to count as vices. So if you want the slogan, most of us are a mixed bag when it comes to our character, which does exist, but we have a mixed bag for our character. That, I think, is also very intuitive and I think very plausible when you look at ordinary life and the real world experience. Okay, so there's, there's my view there. Uh, now, what grounds do I have for thinking that people can move from mixed character into virtue, for instance? Or if you don't buy my story, from vice into virtue, or from incontinence into virtue, or from continence into virtue, whatever the other alternative is. Um, a couple of points, but then I'm also going to say it is somewhat hopeful. Right? Uh, a couple of points. One is that we know the character can change. So there's, uh, there's that obstacle. Because you might just say, our characters are fixed. This is the way we are. It's just stuck in the mud. And so uh, there's no hope for change. We, that's, that's empirically, I think, well established to be false. Character can change. Take conscientiousness, for example. Conscientiousness in uh, students, no offense, um, is low, <laughs> typically. And then it increases over the course of the lifespan, typically. Uh, so character can, can change that way. Uh, with respect to the particular strategies, though, we would want to see uh, longitudinal studies assessing the impact on people's character, right? Not just that day, not even two weeks, but you know, longer term. When I take the strategies, here's a, here's a control group, here's an experimental group, which gets the strategy. Uh, let's see, okay, here's the baseline of the character. Let's see, a month later, 
this group gets the strategy, this group doesn't get the strategy. What is, what's, we, we assess their character at that point. Six months later, a year later, how are we doing? Uh, we don't have those studies, by and large. Maybe there's a few exceptions. Um, you know, Charles can tell me if there, there's some exceptions out there. But uh, very, very few studies like that, So, um, which is disappointing. If we look, when we're doing character assessment and character development and this kind of thing, we want to see those longitudinal studies done. We don't have them. Uh, there are reasons why we don't have them. They're expensive, they take a lot of time, they're hard to do, people, participants get suspicious, the data gets corrupted in those kind of ways and so forth. Uh, so when we wrap it up, come back to the strategies, uh, I think there's some preliminary support for them, but it's very preliminary. And so at the end of the day, maybe it is a leap of faith fitting for this. It, maybe there's some element of leap of faith and some element of hope that they will uh, be effective. But I, I, I guess I, at, at the end of the day, I am more of an optimist than a pessimist. So here we go. Because I am here to exercise the virtue of punctuality. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Miller, and uh, please join me in thanking Mr. Miller. <laughs>